Welcome to the Transnational Times podcast, a production of the Arab Studies Institute that seeks to spotlight the activist proxies, intellectual engagements, historical continuities, and abundant possibilities of transnational solidarities today. I'm Noura Arakat, co-founding director of Jadaliya. On August 21, 2022, law students for justice in Palestine at Berkeley Law School adopted a bylaw that stated it would, quote, not invite speakers that have expressed and continue to hold views or host, sponsor, promote events in support of Zionism, the apartheid state of Israel, and the occupation of Palestine, end quote. At their encouragement, eight other Berkeley groups adopted the bylaw, including law students of African descent, Women of Berkeley Law, the Queer Caucus, and the Asian Pacific American Law Students Association. Though the bylaw barely even registered among Berkeley faculty and students, things took a dramatic turn when the amendment came to the attention of Kenneth Marcus, the Assistant Secretary for Civil Rights at the U.S. Education Department during the Trump administration and the founding director of the Brandeis Center. Marcus penned an article for the Jewish Journal titled Berkeley Develops Jewish Free Zones in reference to the bylaw amendment. The maligning and deliberately misleading article went viral as governors, politicians, and celebrities, including Barbara Streisand, reacted to it, reiterating the false accusation. In response, the Dean of Berkeley Law School, Erwin Chemerinsky, both doubled down that he considered the bylaw offensive and would consider sanctions for groups that excluded members based on religious or political grounds, but that in this case, the bylaw amendment was a matter of free speech. In November 2022, two attorneys filed a Title VI complaint against Berkeley Law School, alleging that the bylaw constituted, quote, profound and deep-seated anti-Semitic discrimination against Berkeley Law School's Jewish community and demanded that the law school rescind the bylaw, among other remedies. Today, I am joined by three esteemed guests to discuss recent controversies at Berkeley Law School and the weaponization of anti-Semitism to silence Palestinian advocacy more generally. Malak Al-Fanna is the proud daughter of Palestinian immigrants from Abu Ghosh and Al-Khalil and a second-year law student and co-president of Law Students for Justice in Palestine at Berkeley Law. She is currently a U.S. Campaign for Palestine Rights Youth Fellow. Taylor Fox is also a Berkeley Law student and organizer, and I'll have her say more about herself as this program begins. And Liz Jackson is a founding staff attorney for Palestine Legal and Cooperating Council with the Center for Constitutional Rights. Her work includes representing students, professors, and activists on free speech and academic freedom issues, documenting the chilling effect of repression campaigns, and educating activists on their rights. She's also defended against several of these Title VI suits, which we are eager to hear all about. Welcome to the Transnational Times podcast, Melek, Taylor, and Liz. Uh, Melek and Taylor, let's begin with you. Can you tell us about what prompted you to propose this bylaw amendment and how you went about getting other student groups on board to do the same? Uh, in particular, what were those conversations like and what do they tell us about the current campus climate around, Palestine, around the Palestinian freedom struggle? Yeah, of course. Thank you so much again for that beautiful intro and for the opportunity to be here to speak with you all today. Um, you know, I just want to say as me and Taylor attend Berkeley Law. Um, boycott, divest, sanctions, this concept is not new at Berkeley whatsoever. And it has a very profound history, especially in terms of other contacts outside of Palestine. So we know that in the 1960s, the free speech movement erupted at UC Berkeley, where students were able to demand their right to support and fundraise for the civil rights movement at a time when UC Berkeley only allowed students to raise funds for a certain political party. And then in the 80s, you have that in response to students calling out against the apartheid that's occurring in South Africa, Berkeley establishes a three-year plan to divest from South Africa and divest in their holdings there. And then again, in 2006, you have that Berkeley voted unanimously to divest their holdings in nine major companies that were doing business in Sudan as a result of the uh, genocide occurring in Darfur. So this concept of boycott is not new at all. And we were just following in the footsteps of the activists and the student labor um, and leadership that has come before us. So I think it's important to honor that as well, that we're not inventing the wheel necessarily. And so 
We also know, though, that at Berkeley Law, we have a $10 million Israeli Studies Institute. We have classes that send students to Israel um, in a time when 2022 is the deadliest year for Palestinians. And in 2023, there's more martyrs than days. Um, and we have a outright Zionist administration that self-identifies as Zionist. And so being students at Berkeley Law, there was little to almost no conversation around Palestine, both in the classroom and I would say outside the classroom as well. And so we wanted to make sure when I drafted the bylaw, I was aware that this was the atmosphere of Berkeley Law at the time. And I'm one of three Palestinians that attend Berkeley Law, an institution with more than 900 students. So we're a very small minority. And so the bylaw is a means of having students have the right to be able to choose what they do with the funds that they have for their student organizations, who they choose to bring to speak, the, the movements that they choose to support, and how they want to support the Palestinian liberation movement. As an organizer in college, oftentimes when it came to divestment, people would go straight to student government. And even if student government passed and unanimously approved divestment, the president of our college at the time, I remember, had ended up blocking that vote and vetoing it. And then activism sort of kind of disintegrated. People had built up all this momentum and now what do we do from there? So we wanted to make sure that that wouldn't happen. So when I drafted the bylaw, I reached out to student organizations that were all affinity groups. Most of our LSJP are students of color or students that are part of some gender, religious, racial minority and are a part of an affinity group. So we wanted to make sure that we built those coalitions, built those alliances in a way that solidarity with Palestine would not be theoretical, but would be put in practice. And so I ended up drafting the bylaw. I would send it. I chose around a dozen, I would say, affinity groups um, because we have 109 student organizations. So there is no way I was going to be able to reach out to all of them. Um, and I said, hey, this is a conversation I want to have. I feel that as student groups, and as affinity groups that do have Palestinian students in them, we should be in support of the Palestine movement for liberation outwardly. So I would meet with boards. I would answer any questions they had because we have students who have a range of knowledge about Palestine, some who have no familiarity, some who know a lot, some who have are in that gray area where they want to support but they also are aware of its conflation with anti-Semitism. Um, so we had a lot of meaningful discussions and I think that was the beauty of the bylaw in a sense that we're able to come with students who we might not really have a relationship outside of the classroom, but we're able to engage in meaningful dialogue and ensure that education is a political tool. So by educating people about Palestine, by answering questions, you're able to show that compassion when it comes to coalition building and ensure that we're not gatekeeping knowledge, that we're ensuring that people are aware of what they're supporting. After that, each club would vote on the bylaw according to the democratic processes they have in their constitution. So some clubs, for example, require only that the board um, agree to the bylaw and then the bylaw would pass. Some have rules that two thirds of all student membership within the organization must vote yes for the bylaw and then the bylaw would be adopted. So that would be up to each club. They would democratically uh, vote on it. And out of those dozen orgs I reached out to back in the summer, nine of the 12 um, ended up adopting it. And I just wanna highlight that because a lot of the articles that came out were like only nine organizations adopted the bylaw. That's not true. Nine out of the 12 <laughs> that I reached out to adopted the bylaw, um, all of whom were affinity groups and all of whom are majority students of color. So the majority of students of color at Berkeley Law supported this bylaw as well as other students. Um, and I think that that's really important to highlight. And I think it's, I'm very grateful for the opportunity to be able to start these conversations in a time when I would say I was Palestinian, people would say, where is that? Um, so now we have a lot of buzzing around campus, around Palestine, and I'll let Taylor speak more on the campus climate. Yeah, I also wanted to uplift that 
the work of Malak and other organizers in assembling a really strong multiracial coalition of students standing up for Palestine, I think it's part of how we should understand the Zionist backlash as well, in just the really strong showing of solidarity, as she was saying, um, from folks who had been involved in Palestine organizing for some time, but all the way to people who were really just encountering um, <clears throat> the situation and, and learning from the gut, from the jump. Um, and I think part of the organizing that um, I was involved in and, and some other Jewish students as well um, was fighting the disinformation campaign that was coming from inside campus and, and certainly outside of campus, alleging that the bylaw was inherently anti-Semitic. Um, our dean even said at one point that over 90% or about 90% of Jewish students would be excluded from the bylaw, which was absolutely false and just goes into this conflation of um, anti-Semitism, um, hatred of Jews with criticism of Israel um, that we all know just is flatly not true and is part of the work that goes into repressing the Palestine solidarity movement and especially at campuses like ours. Um, so yeah, I think in addition to conversations around Palestine that um, a lot of us were having with student organizations, there was also some political education work that had to go into really crafting that distance between recognizing, you know, we can recognize that Israel is a settler colonial state, and that actually has nothing to do with the Jewish people. And also Judaism goes far beyond a nation state. Um, and so I think part of doing that work too um, was, yeah, just really great to have conversations with people. And I think we were up against a lot of um, really high profile narratives that were trying to craft this really tight link between the bylaw and anti-Semitism. And I think that work is still ongoing in many ways and, and still part of the fight. We're going to definitely get into this conflation as it's part of this broader discussion, but just to narrow in a little bit more on the campus climate, we know that Dean Chimarinsky spoke out of both sides of his mouth, uh, both defending mm -hmm. um, LSJP's right to free speech, as well as um, throwing you under the bus for being offensive and exclusionary. And so can you tell us a bit about um, what the faculty uh, support looks like or doesn't look like or what that that position from the dean um, how that's reverberating in your experience yeah um I think just to paint a picture um you know some of the backlash we had included the doxing of more than I would say I would say half our LSJP um their information was put on websites um they were shamed they were humiliated we had trucks that were going around not just the Berkeley Oakland area but around other states in Texas as well um, that had student leaders names on it and said they were part of quote Berkeley Law's anti-Semitic class of 2023. We also have law professors at T14s saying that we as students should not be considered for clerkships. We had law firms that fund some of our affinity groups backing out because they said that we were being anti-Semitic. So this comes at a time when students, we have students that are afraid to go to campus. We have students that are afraid that they're gonna have trucks. I personally had trucks circling my apartment. We have billboards on our, all around the Berkeley, Oakland area that say, quote, you don't have to go to law school to know that anti-Zionism is anti-Semitism. So it's a method of intimidation that no matter where you go, if you're going to campus, you're going to the grocery store, you're going to be with friends, that this is something that will be on your mind. That that fear and that feeling of, I don't feel in control of my safety is something that many students felt last semester, as well as a sense of isolation from other students. We were having students on who have Zionist beliefs recording things that we were saying at events, workshops that we were trying to hold. And so it's this constant fear that was ongoing. And then you enter in some of the op-eds that our dean was writing to a country that is waiting to see what is going to happen to us. Are people going to deny us for clerkships? Are we going to have um, consequences for our actions? And then you have op-eds from Dean Chem that where he says, quote, most importantly, no group has violated the law school's policy and excluded a speaker on account of being Jewish or holding particular views about Israel. Such conduct, of course, would be subject to sanctions. So now you have the dean of one of a top 10 law school in this nation saying that he will sanction students. And so 
this was obviously very, um, it was very emotionally difficult for many people. But then on the other hand, when you confront, when we confronted Dean Chem in multiple meetings, he had nothing to say except that I defend your right with this bylaw. But unfortunately, what you're telling us in private and what you are telling us to public and the media, being aware of the position and the power and the influence he holds as the dean of a top 10 law school is very harmful. And so when it came to faculty, we found that we had faculty who decided to withdraw from being advisors of any group that adopted the bylaw because they felt that it was anti-Semitic. We had faculty that signed a letter affirming Zionist beliefs. We also had faculty that did want to support us, but lacked tenure status and felt scared, felt scared to stand out against administration, felt scared to support us. And so I feel that it was only when the trucks came, did that conversation with Dean Chem shift a little bit. We had warned Dean Chemerinsky because um, we had seen a tweet where a Zionist had threatened to bring trucks with student leaders' names on it. And we had warned Dean Chemerinsky before it even occurred. And yet we were kind of seen as, oh, it's you're being slightly dramatic. It hasn't happened yet. And then it happened. <laughs> and so that is when I feel until Dean Chemerinsky started to slightly alter his narrative to the public and affirm our right to free speech. But it shouldn't have taken the, the harm and the um, upsetting circumstances that occurred for the administration to even defend us. Um, and I'll, there's definitely also that was harmful to this, the conflation of anti-Zionism with anti-Semitism, which I will let Taylor <laughs> speak way more to. I, I feel like what you're describing um, is the epitome of creating a hostile environment on campus for students, is the epitome of what uh, discrimination probably, because they're also conflating your identities, right, and and eviscerating the tech, you know, this multiracial group that you've created into a single category. And so here, uh, Liz, I want to turn to you. What does that have to do with Title VI? Um, and as someone who has extensive uh, experience of defending students against Title VI allegations, um, specifically those who have accused F SJPs of creating a hostile environment for Jewish students, uh, what do we learn from those experiences and those previous complaints? Uh, and and how, does it, how does it demonstrate a bit of a double standard in the situation? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so Title VI refers to Title VI of the 1964 Civil Rights Act, Martin Luther King's great achievement. It prohibits discrimination based on race, national origin, ethnicity. Um, and it, um, you know, on, on, on all, for, it prohibits such discrimination um, within all institutions that receive federal funding. So that would include um, almost all university and college campuses, public and private. And um, it has long been a tool of the Zionist lobby in the U.S. to try to distort and abuse this law by alleging that students like Malik and Taylor, who, um, you know, and me when I was a student, and you, Nora, when you were a student, we um, who are advocating for Palestinian rights, liberation, humanity, um, even, you know, telling your own stories um, that that all and, you know, and, and advocating for accountability for Israel's decades consistent, you know, you know, brutal, violent violation of international law that all students who are engaged in this kind of activity are somehow um, violating uh their felt their classmate their Jewish classmates civil rights by talking about Palestine. Um, and that this um, create the, the the Zionist fiction um, is that this creates a hostile environment for Jewish students. Um, this is um, a story that they have tried to um, manufacture um, and um, you know abuse civil rights law by making this argument and and applying it, um, demanding that the federal government investigate campuses like UC Berkeley, where students um, like you and us um, are advocating for Palestinian freedom. So it's an abuse of civil rights law, um, but it's been a primary strategy that Zionists have adopted and it goes hand in hand with um, other strategies where they cannot, um, you know, win the, um, if there were to be a debate on campus about 
Zionism, um, they cannot win that debate because it's increasingly clear to people of conscience that what you know that what is happening with our tax dollars is unconscionable. Um, there is no way to defend the um, Zionist state um, historically or currently. You know, as as we watch, you know, the most murderous year yet. So. Um, instead of trying to win that debate, the strategy of the lobby is to crush the debate, silence it, stop it from happening, um, scare students by driving trucks, you know, with, you know, Hitler on it around Berkeley um, to try and stop us from doing anything. So what you just described about the really desperate backlash to try to punish you for saying we, we don't want to use our student resources to host Zionist speakers, no thanks, that kind of desperate, nasty backlash to, um, is um, another part of that strategy is to file, is to abuse the law to file um, so-called Title VI complaints against UC Berkeley, trying to force um, the university to, um, instead of for, instead of trying to force you to self-censor, this, this strategy tries to force the university to censor you. Um, and that is the, it's a strategy of, of desperation and it, and it abuses the law. Now, um, the, uh, it, it, it is a long strategy. So I, maybe I should stop there. I can go into some of the history um, of, of how that strategy has failed in the past, but like any strategy of desperation, they, they are not giving up because they have no other strategy. Well, I wanna affirm what you're saying, both that this is actually tactics of the week, um, but also lift up that we've seen, mm -hmm. I've in my experience at, by the way, we're all either Berkeley Law alum or current students. And so there's a trajectory that we can map here. Mm -hmm. But there was a time when we were doing these activities where Zionist students actually wanted to debate us and actually wanted, um, right? Actually wanted to try to come at us. And yet now- So interesting. As I'm attending events that I'm speaking, we see that the students are encouraged to not come to our events, but instead to urge the administration to shut the event down. So echoing and uh, what mm. and undergirding what you're saying, Liz, that this is no, you know, it it wasn't defensible, but even less so now there's this, you know, kind of fragility that's associated to it, that they not can not only respond to our uh, arguments, but that they're that they're somehow triggered by them as well, and so the response needs to be to shut this down. Of course, this isn't applied to us as students who have been assaulted physically on campus, who are harassed, who receive death threats. Those aren't taken as, as seriously at all. So yes, Liz, it would be great to get a sense of the historical efforts to use Title VI because it's so relevant to the present and how those um, tactics have, have failed and yet remain used because they waste our time, which is the point, right? Frivolous suits are actually effective if you have the means to keep bringing them. Um, and so if you can tell us a little bit about that legacy, we would appreciate it. is that um, it is to intimidate and to chill speech. And I'm and to sorry, drown. Liz, the you all were frozen for, it looks like, a minute. If you can just start over. Thank you. Yeah. So the architect of this legal strategy to justify censorship, who you referred to in the introduction, um, Kenneth Marcus, the former uh, so-called uh, Secretary for Civil Rights at the Department of Education under Trump. Um, he said explicitly in an op-ed that the strategy is to chill speech and not necessarily to win these baseless cases. Now, he said that as he was losing in the legal sense when his cases were being dismissed. Um, and he was explicit that what you just said, that the strategy is to um, scare administrators um, to use, uh, you know, fake news media headlines um, that there's anti-Semitism at Berkeley to scare administrators into shutting down, um, you know, and, and and basically what you described, Malik and Taylor, threatening students with sanctions um, to make it stop, um, because you know to scare so you, to scare universities so they will then shut down students. He said that explicitly in an op-ed. And um, now, so 
And then another piece that I just want to add in terms of what the campus climate is actually like for Palestinians, you know, you you didn't get a chance to mention this, Malik, but we know that when when you came um, with this strategy saying, you know, let's ask fellow students not to host Zionist speakers, there was already, you know, yeah, decades of hostility for Palestinians on campus. And then most recently, just before the, and this was, you know, your first action kind of as campus was coming back together, right? And just just before the shutdown in the campus shutdown in 2020, spring 2020, there was a student who got up on the mic at a at a major public uh, student government uh, meeting and threatened, what was the quote? He threatened to kill Palestinians on campus. He, he issued a public death threat. Um, I think, what, what, do you have the quote in front of you? He said, he said, I'm going to join the IDF. So what, I'm, I'm looking for it. I don't know if you have the quote. Um, but you know there was a a present hostile and scary climate for Palestinian students and oh I found it he said I plan after I graduate on joining the IDF the Israeli military to eliminate Palestinian nationalism and Palestinians from the world end quote and then fled the room so this statement you know really sent shockwaves of real fear for students physical safety you know, my phone blew up. I was getting texts. I think I, you know, there and there was all. This was already at a time when Palestinians and their allies on campus were facing harassment, being stalked, yelled at, spat upon. Um, so, as you said, Nora, physically assaulted. So, your bylaw strategy really was, in one way, I don't, I don't know if you would agree with this, but I, I read it as an attempt to improve the climate for yourself. Does that feel true to you? Yeah, definitely. I mean, we were aware of what had occurred at that meeting and what was said, in addition to the fact that this also happened in response to Bears for Palestine trying to have photos of um, Palestinian revolutionary figures like Leila Khalid and mm -hmm. having to constantly have their spaces vandalized, have to constantly defend their right to being able to honor the Palestinian revolutionary leaders of this movement and have to constantly go through this argument that of you're supporting terrorists and Hamas and all these terms that are just being thrown around. So I completely agree. Yeah, okay. So I just wanted to kind of add that that context. Um, and so in, you know, so that is the context where now, um, the Israel lobby is saying, uh, you know, that is the kind of threats that um, Palestinian students and their allies are receiving. And so on top of that, um, the Israel lobby is using title, has historically used Title VI and is continuing to do it to try to demand that the administration shut down any attempt you make, despite you're already being threatened with physical assault and you're still bringing this conversation. So now here's a legal strategy just to kind of cherry on top. So essentially, Dating back um, since 2004, when um, Ken Marcus and the, you know, kind of his colleagues in the Israel lobby were trying to find a, a legal way to stop the conversation, um, he started bringing Title VI complaints against UC Irvine, UC Santa Cruz, and then in 2010 brought a Title VI complaint against UC Berkeley. The um, the crux of the argument against UC Berkeley was that the um, university tolerated a hostile climate for Jew allegedly a hostile climate for Jewish students because it allowed um, the um, boycott, divestment, and sanctions debate to happen on campus. It allowed um, students to bring a, a resolution to the student government demanding that student funds be divested from companies complicit in the oppression and occupation of Palestinians. Um, that conversation itself was considered um, so threatening to some Jewish students that it was, it was, you know, they demanded that um, that uh, the university shut down any comparison to Israel as a barbarian nation. Um, completely mischaracterized um, the campus climate, um, and you know, tried to ask a federal court, and then when that failed, ask the Department of Education to require UC Berkeley to shut it down. That case was dismissed. Um, in 2014, um, the um, Department of Education also rejected similar arguments against UC Santa Cruz, UC Irvine, and Rutgers University in New Jersey. Uh, the Department of Education said, look, um, you know, I paraphrase it as this is college, like this is what happens at college. The exact language was this kind of robust and discordant expression 
is to be expected at a, um, a camp, a university of higher learning, I think is, um, I might've missed a word there, but, but the essential thing is robust and discord and expression. Okay. This is what happens at college. We get uncomfortable. We talk about our lives. Um, you know, we meet people who have different worldviews than us and are challenged by that. Um, it seems like maybe they would put this strategy away since it was such a clear legal failure at that time. They said, well, actually, we're going to keep going with it because it scares people. And in the meantime, they developed this, um, continued to, they, the Israel lobby continued to develop this definition known as the IRA definition, which I think we'll get to. Um, but it essentially defines all criticism of Israel, most criticism of Israel, calling Israel a racist state, for example, as officially anti-Semitic. So they continued with this definition and, and, and under Trump, um, Marcus was successful to um, uh, convince Trump along with the Christian, powerful Christian Zionist lobby who was behind Trump in signing an executive order directing federal agencies to consider this IRA definition. And um, so they, you know, really attempted to um, officially incorporate this definition into federal law because they had lost at the Department of Education level. And they, by the way, they also lost in Congress. Um, so via executive order from the top, they tried to just slam it down. Um, and then um, since then, we've seen at least 16 complaints filed across the United States, including the latest at UC Berkeley against colleges and universities similarly alleging that advocacy on campus for Palestinian freedom, even just, um, you know, saying that Palestinian, even Palestinians just saying we are here, we exist, this is my story, um, that this kind of campus speech is allegedly um, causing a hostile climate for Jews and therefore must be shut down. So we've seen at least 16 complaints. Um, most of them have failed or are just sitting there, um, you know, pending. But as Marcus said, they have their effect. They scare administrators which explains the treatment that you've received from Chimerinsky, who just embarrassed himself, who you know used to be considered um, a, a First Amendment expert and um, you know, was so sort of pummeled by these threats that he humiliated himself by you know, saying you know, garbage at both sides of his mouth about trying to say something about how the First Amendment applied. So that is the, that is the kind of effect, is it intimidates administrators, but not students. I think um, you know Shimerinsky had has 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 gotten here steadily. His lack of defense of UC Irvine students um, in an incident, I think, in the early two thousands, when they disrupted a talk by a top um, Israeli official, who were then slammed with uh, criminal um, suits. He failed to defend them uh, during that time as well during his time at UC Irvine, and so. But I do agree that this is this is this idea, the effect of these lawsuits of both being frivolous and yet effective. I don't know what's going on with the internet, but I'm marking another point, um, another timestamp. So I'll just um sorry about that, folks. Um, but let me just say, uh, let me continue. Where were we? Um Yes, Liz, you're right to emphasize that these uh, lawsuits are simultaneously frivolous and yet effective in signaling to the administration to basically create um, a double standard for students. In fact, your colleague Dylan Saba um, at Palestine Legal has highlighted that there are Hillel actually bars anti-Zionist speakers from speaking on at their events, an explicit double standard that doesn't get the same treatment. But since you've both since you've all mentioned the IRA definition, I think it's important to pivot there before we go back to the to the controversy over the bylaw. Um, so what is the IRA definition, right? The International Holocaust Remembrance Alliance creates this definition. Um, what is it? And what is its relate, you know, how would you describe its relationship to this political moment of uh, really a very robust pro-Palestinian movement in the United States that is marked, I think, by a particular apex in 2021 during the Unity Intifada. And how does it correspond to broader um, efforts to, to shut down efforts from the top down um, that's embodied in anti-BDS um, legislation on, on the state level? So I'm going to give that I, to, to all of you and, and, and you know, wherever you'd like to start.
Okay, I can jump in, um, but please, yeah, jump in when ready. So the, the so-called IRA definition, International Holocaust Remembrance Alliance definition, um, is the favored censorship tool of the Israel lobby twinned together with um, Title VI complaints and attempts to uh, restrict our right to boycott. So um, it's, you know, trying alongside right wing and corporate allies to codify or integrate into official law this um, definition, um, trying to incorporate it into state law, federal law, um, university policy and policies in large private companies. Um, I really do think it's one of the most significant threats to Palestine advocacy on a national level because, yes, it is a direct response to the growing tide of solidarity with Palestinian freedom struggles internationally, and it, um, you know, it, it's a it's a legal tool to harass and censor. So, the definition claims to be about anti-Semitism, but no, it is concerned. If you look, read the definition, it's concerned primarily with silencing criticism of the Israeli state. Um, it has, you know, kind of like a bland general definition on top, and then it goes into examples, contemporary examples of anti-Semitism. There's 11. So seven out of the 11 examples of anti-Semitism are focused on the Israeli state, you know, conflating Jewish people as a whole with the state of Israel. So meanwhile, anti-Semitism Hatred, violence, real threats against Jews is surging in the U.S. and elsewhere. Um, white supremacist, white nationalist anti-Semitism having nothing to do with the Israeli state. And so organizations who claim to be fighting anti-Semitism are focused on Israel and criticizing Israel and defending Israel and stopping people like us from advocating for freedom and justice and equality for Palestinians. Meanwhile, real anti-Semitism is on the rise. So it's, you know, really scary. Um, to be so distracted. Um, so these seven out of 11 examples focus on, for example, applying, make it, call it anti-Semitic to apply a so-called double standard to Israel or claiming that it is anti-Semitic to call Israel as a racist endeavor. So, you know, the dangers involved in IRA are not like theoretical. It's, we see it everywhere um, where, you know, the definition is just routinely daily wielded to shut down events, to cancel classes, to, um, you know, uh, uh, legislators have a, a tr attempted to apply criminal penalties um, to the simple act of speaking out for, you know, against Israeli abuses. And one example of that is in um, in UC Berk uh, in Berkeley, what um, Malik and Taylor described these billboards, these horrifying hot pink billboards that have sprung up all over town that really make no sense to most people. You don't have to go to law school to know that anti-Zionism is anti-Semitism. Some Jewish activists redecorated them and wrote actually, you don't have to go to law school to know that Zionism is racism or anti-Zionism is anti-racism. And the Berkeley police said in, a, in, to, to, in the press to the Zionist organization who put the billboards, the billboards up that this would be, that this isn't being investigated as a hate crime. So they didn't reference the IRA death definition exactly, but it is the same concept. In Berkeley, the police said that this stupid little redecoration graffiti is classified and now recorded as a hate crime against Jews. It was Jews themselves who, so it makes no sense. And it, we kind of laughed at that, but it's not funny in other places. Um, there are, you know, the, they are really truly threatening to put people, you know, in cages um, because they criticize Israel. So I think I'll stop there. Um, it's a really dangerous definition. It expands the scope of policing, not to mention censors people everywhere. Well, I know that, you know, you are highlighting the irony of the Berkeley police doing this. And I was thinking to myself, but they're the police. Um, um, Melek and Taylor, this actually comes up in addition to your own campaign, this comes up at the, on the Berkeley campus where students, right? Um, Pro-Israeli students tried to pass this as a resolution mm -hmm. in student government and failed because you defeated them there too. Can you tell us about that effort? Yeah, so um, UC Berkeley student government voted to indefinitely table the IRA resolution, which I think especially coming off the heels of the bylaw on our campaign felt like 
a win and, and felt like, okay, our campus and not just the law school, the entire UC Berkeley community and, and the thousands of people who are a part of it um, are recognizing the extremely false narrative that, you know, Ira pits Palestinian liberation against Jewish safety. And for all the reasons that Liz said, it's entirely ridiculous and is grounded in tying the Jewish people to one nation state, one settler colonial nation state. And it was I think, incredible to see that being recognized by, by our community. Um, and, and yeah, I think I'll also just uh, briefly adding on to what Liz said, I, I think the, the point of IRA is obvious. It would add legal credibility to the false claims and the entire really narrative enterprise that was built around claiming that our bylaw was anti-Semitic, that it was harming Jewish students, um, things that everyone knew to be untrue who were involved with the movement. And even if IRA is not in effect, I think post, you know, the Berkeley student government tabling it, its cultural effects still live on. And I think beyond the sort of definition itself, this is part of a much broader political struggle that is being waged by Zionists, um, as you all know, to silence um, students in the Sean campuses. And so I think, yeah, the work on that front definitely continues, but it was a really exciting victory to see. Um, can you describe to us who brought uh, the resolution at all to the student government and how um, it was, how the defeat was organized? I mean, that obviously didn't happen by itself. Somebody is lob lobbying the student senators. Was it also a multiracial coalition? Were they already educated in prime so that they didn't need that? What did those efforts look like? Um, well, I was actually wondering if you could speak a little bit more to that, because I think that was more on like their their Tripolitan's work um, that we were supporting a little from the back end. But the like nitty gritty of the campaign, I'm a little less familiar with. Yeah, so that was a majority I want to credit Bears for Palestine, who really organized and un really moved the campus and mobilized them. Um, we were just there to support, I would say. Um, I do know that the meeting ended up going till around 3 a.m., if I'm not mistaken, um, with more than 200 people present on the Zoom, and I would say more than 100 in person, if I'm not mistaken. Um, and so it was really a showing out of affinity groups and student organizations from all over the campus. You have the graduate students, you have undergraduate students, you have outside community members, you have people from Palestine Youth Movement, from ABROC, from so many different orgs, Jewish Voices for Peace, so many different people coming together in a room, holding signs, wearing kofiyas, even if they're not the ones that are speaking outwardly, just being there, that existence is resistance was really solidified. And so um, it was really an opportunity where I know that students from Berkeley Law, Justice for Palestine spoke, and Bears for Palestine. Um, but I would argue that, yes, it was a multiracial coalition. It was across campuses. It was even, I would say, across the, the across Turtle Island. You know, you had SJPs I saw all over social media that were supporting the petition that Bears for Palestine was circulating, that were able to join the Zoom and show their support, whether it be having um, a banner and a Zoom box. And so I think that in terms of the details of the campaign, it was very, very well organized and it was very well done. And, you know, as law students, it's just so incredible to see undergraduate students who have such busy lives and so many commitments able to do this. And it was a big win where um, we actually attended the National Students for Justice in Palestine conference. And that was the big topic of the year was the IRA definition and how SJPs at other campuses who have maybe only five people in their SJPs were able to look at Bears for Palestine and the pro-Palestine activism at Berkeley as a model of resistance for them. I, I mean, again, this is just another tactic that they've forced, you know, um, advocates to put out like small wildfires Liz, as you know, Palestine Legal intervened in the case where it was the American Bar Association that wanted to condemn anti-Semitism, but based on the IRA definition, that was defeated as well. Um, and yet we see that even when it is defeated, there's a culture and a residue that's left behind that if, if not completely adopted, creates a complexity and confusion and a paralysis to the, you know, that actually advantages maintaining an oppressive status quo. 
Uh, Liz, similar to the IRA definition is the anti-BDS legislation, which is again, the top-down mm -hmm. strategy adopted at the mm -hmm. state and municipal level. Uh, can you tell us about that? I know that there's something like 30 states that have already adopted it, uh, some 11 additional states that have proposed it, uh, in addition to a number of lawsuits, one that was um, just appealed to the Supreme Court from the Eighth uh, Circuit and where the Supreme Court denied cert to review. Um, so can you can you walk us through some of that um, that legislative effort and, and an update about uh, the, the judicial strategy? Sure. Um, yeah, so I, I um, again, another strategy of desperation to stop the debate, um, really a sort of twin strategy. The, um, it has uh, swept the nation. I mean, really what's happening is that um, the Israel lobby is aligned with um, the corporate oil lobby, um, the gun lobby, um, and they're actually using um, Palestine and the um, you know boycott for Palestinian rights. They're using um, the attempt to restrict our right to boycott for Palestinian rights as a template to attack other movements um, and really sort of restrict our you know really basic democratic right to use our consumer power um, in multiple ways. So they're um, you know it's a it's a um, alignment of right wing forces. And I don't actually have an accurate count at the moment of how many um, bills there have been and how many states are restricting our right to boycott because it is moving so fast. There have been at least 20, and I asked my colleague who's working on the tracking for an update and she doesn't have it at the moment because it's been at least 20, it might be at least 30 bills introduced just this legislative session. So it is at least 30, I believe it may 35 states that actively restrict our right to boycott. Um, and, you know, there may be more by the end of this legislative session. And it, it's, um, you know, only a fraction of these bills pass, um, partially because they're actually not popular democratically. Um, this is, a you know, a minority right wing interest, which is capturing state legislators. But um, even there's so many bills that even though a small minority of them pass, that means that the majority of states now restrict our right to boycott in some way. Um, they are, you know, mostly unconstitutional, at least in spirit, even if technically they get whittled down um, enough so that they can be sort of, um, they can pass muster in front of very conservative judges. Um, that's what happened in, so so the, the majority of bills that have been challenged have been struck down as unconstitutional. Um, the uh, Arkansas Times case is a, a, the Arkansas Times newspaper challenged the Arkansas bill as unconstitutional because they don't want to um, have to sign an loyalty, a loyalty oath, a loyalty oath to promise not to boycott Israel in order to um, receive state contracts or to receive, you know, advertisements from the state to receive any money from the state. So they opposed it as a violation of the Arkansas Times opposed it as a violation of their constitutional rights. Um, they won in the lower court. The lower court said, yeah, this is unconstitutional. The Eighth Circuit, which is extremely conservative, one of the most conservative circuits in the country, um, overturned that and upheld the law. And then the Supreme Court just decided not to review the Eighth Circuit's decision. So that law remains in place, but it is limited just to the, um, you know, just to the Eighth Circuit. And um, in fact, most contracts in um, it's 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 actually a li quite limited law. It's not. It doesn't mean that you. It is illegal to boycott Israel in Arkansas or anywhere else. It just means it's a, it just has a limited application. But Zionists use it to try to you know they will distort like they do with IRA. Um, they will completely distort um, misinformation campaigns, like Taylor said earlier. Um, the nature of the law and sort of try to make people believe that it's somehow just illegal to boycott Israel. So. Um, it's a big problem, you know, as is the capture of state legislatures everywhere, a lot of scary legislation of all kinds. And, um, you know, our, my, like, what I want to say about it is to encourage people really to just use, you know, the, the law, the courts are not going to free Palestine, the courts are not going to win us justice anywhere. Um, you know, you have, you, you maintain your right to boycott and divest and sanction for Palestinian rights. And 
go for it. And the best legal, you know, we will all continue to challenge these laws in the courts. So the legal battles will be waged, but all of us um, have an obligation and an opportunity to continue mainstreaming boycott, divestment, and sanctions for Palestinian rights. Um, and that's the best legal defense um, is to mainstream it. I think um, one of the unintended consequences of this, you know, the fact that this becomes a model for other nefarious actors in order to quell speech and popular movements is what has steadily placed Israel, right, as part of an increasing right-wing agenda. Before it used to be a, you know, part of a bipartisan agenda, but we can even map in, in, in voting trends, in political trends, that increasingly just thinking about, you know, the Republican and Democratic parties, that this has created a wedge so that Israel has become a Republican issue and alignment with these other issues. So as Palestine increasingly, incre you know, enters the progressive agenda, Israel is increasingly um, entering a conservative agenda, one that's setting up interesting trends uh, for the future and what's to come. Um, Melek and Taylor, I want to turn back to you in the bylaw amendment. So at the start of the uh, conversation, you explained to us that nine out of the 12 organizations that you approached also adopted it. And I think that that's so illuminating because all of the articles that I read about your campaign similarly emphasize that only nine out of 100 groups right, um, had adopted this. But that number has increased since the controversy, that far from intimidating the student groups, that the student groups have have for one reason or another that you can explain to us, have actually now, more of them have adopted the resolution. Can you uh, update us on, on what's happening um, and what's going on internally um, and, and why they're not intimidated? Yeah, for sure. Um, you know, I always like to emphasize this, you know, being Palestinian, um, my great grandfather was a Palestinian freedom fighter and he ultimately, he had his fingernails plucked with pliers when he was in prison and my great grandmother became a widow and she raised she raised my grandma she raised and then my grandma raised my parents and then my parents brought me here and this line of palestinian activism is all thanks to the revolutionary practice of samud of steadfastness and when you think about what that means to remain steadfast you know um I'm I'm a big I don't know academic nerd I guess um, but professor Palestinian professor Liana Mieri said that samud I love this definition is a form of revolutionary becoming where samud presents as a line of flight in the face of violent colonial attempts to cement the indefinite positionality of Palestinians as the colonized and Israelis as their superior colonizer. And I think that's exactly what the media, what Zionist um, groups, what other people who are not in support of this bylaw attempted to do. They attempted to put us in this position where we are seen as victims, where we are seen as a group of students that naively pushed out a bylaw and were able to be silenced and able to face attacks by the outside. And that is completely false. I'm so happy to report that due to our allies, due to our coalitions and our communities that now we have 23 student organizations that have adopted the bylaw. Not a single student organization has repealed the bylaw, although there were efforts by Zionists on campus to have that happen, where even one club re-voted on the bylaw and it still passed. And we had the National Lawyers Guild adopt the bylaw in all their chapters across Turtle Island. And then we also got news that um, two law schools who... I will not name right now for safety reasons who are allies have also adopted the bylaw and have been pushing it at the student organizations that they work with. Um, and we've, re we've received support from, you know, Pal Legal, which we owe so much of our, our efforts and our labor to, as well as activists like Muhammad al-Kurd or Professor Muhammad Fadil, um, Hatem Bizyan at Berkeley. And so this is just a reminder again that the, we are we were they attempted to silence us, but that we are here to stay. And this bylaw will continue to grow in numbers. Um, and we really do see it as just a way, a form of resistance, as well as a reminder that Palestinians on the ground in Palestine have been doing this labor and this work for years. I mean, I was working in Palestine last summer during my one out and had the opportunity to work with organizers in Masafar Yatta. And 
the amount of courageous bravery and the humor and the life that exists within these spaces, we owe it to them. And they have been that hand of organizing and activism. And as students at Berkeley Law, we will continue to support them and support the movement. And um, also on a last note, I really would love if Taylor could take this part, talking about the way that conversation around Zionism and around anti-Semitism on campus has contributed to Taylor and other students' creation of Berkeley Jews for Palestine, which I will allow her to speak to more. Yeah, I, I want to uplift and echo everything Lock said. And um, yeah, before jumping to the Berkeley Jews for Palestine too, I, I think I also would mention that when we started getting at our most powerful as the bylaw was spreading, that's really when the backlash became explosive. And I think in part our ability to withstand that collectively was that we had relationships within our community. Um, we had like people in LHVP were in affinity groups and we knew our community and were able to have conversations and really keep them going even as the backlash was intensifying. Um, and I think that was a big part of our ability to withstand that. Um, and yeah, I guess turning to Berkeley Jews for Palestine um, and maybe just very quick background context, um, a few anti-Zionist Jews were just sort of talking as the backlash began and, and specifically as Dean Chemerinsky came out against the bylaw and sent an email um, to LHAP and other members of the Berkeley community, you know, kind of conflating the bylaw with anti-Semitism and the way that it was being done in our name, saying that, oh, this is what Jewish students want, you know, that that was the sort of narrative of the administration that the bylaw is making Berkeley a hostile environment for Jewish students. Um, and just we sort of started organizing out of the sense of this cannot be done in our name. And I think it was really yeah exciting to sort of build that community and, and to be working in solidarity with LSJP. And I think that's work that absolutely needs to continue as well, especially as, um, you know, ho hopefully the, what we saw last month was a death knell for Ira, but I think it's always in the water, um, whether it's formally or culturally. And I think it's, yeah, important to have um, vocal anti-Zionist Jewish communities on campus um, speaking out, especially as we saw over the past few months when there were genuine threats to students of color and their safety, there was balancing. There were death threats, um, the, the trucks that Mark mentioned following students around, um, and then the fact that that was being under-prioritized over hypothetical threats to Jewish student safety um, was just obviously unacceptable. And yeah, I think that was sort of part of our strategy going in, into last semester. I think that that's really important if somebody is speaking for you um, to, to, to at least push back and say, right, not in my name, right? Because that's definitely a, a weaponization and a very perverse use of, you know, our various vulnerabilities in order to push a nefarious agenda. So thank you for your labor, um, Taylor. I want to end um, maybe by echoing, Malak, what you were saying, but asking Liz and Taylor to add to this, that as other, in addition to drawing inspiration from Palestinians on the ground and being in relationship to them, in addition from this revolutionary line of sumud um, that sustains um, Palestinians and, pal and, and Palestine um, as a place, as a concept, as, as, as a land um, and grounded history, what other advice would you offer student groups who are considering doing something similar on their campus what tools are might be available to them? How could should they be prepared for the backlash? What legal tools may they consider as, as they're preparing this? So how is it that we can continue to grow like seeds? Well, I'll just throw out there that the, the I think you already named the best tools. Um, solidarity is number one. I mean, safety and numbers and real relationships, real organizing. I mean, that's why the bylaw is so brilliant. Um, and that's how you've been able to persevere. And I really think like real organizing where you really know and understand each other. Um, education tools, like the best legal defense for boycott, divestment and sanctions um, on all levels is to really humanize 
Palestinians tell, you know, tell the stories and um, mainstream Palestinian rights. And that's number one. And then, you know, the First Amendment is still real for you. It applies um, on every public school campus and every private school has free speech rights um, or should, and you can fight for them. Um, and remembering that many of the boycott laws are unconstitutional. And then also Title VI is a tool for, for Palestinians and your and allies too. Like that is, you know, as we talked about, then um, you also can complain about the hostile environment and demand remedies to make the, and, you know, you also um, sh you know, should be um, protected from a hostile racist environment that denies your humanity. So we're also, um, you know, really encouraging people to think about that tool as something that you can use to remedy anti-Palestinian racism. And, and Palestine Legal is here for everybody who wants our help and to understand more about these tools. So don't hesitate to contact us. I'll also say that um, in addition to you knowing your community and building power within it and really sort of um, building on those relationships to you kind know, of get that sort of solidarity um, that we've been talking about this whole time that I think was really key to the bylaw being as successful as it was um, even in spite of the backlash. I think mobilizing resources outside of your campus community too, um, certainly like was the saying, how legal, uh, but also other local organizations who are really down for the fight. I think part of the backlash is to make students feel highly isolated, like literally on Berkeley, they're not safe coming to campus because of the intimidation and the fear mongering. And I think part of what was, you know, really great to see over the past um, few months was a number of different organizations coming out in support of us um, and in solidarity with us. We had a letter with a number of signatories um, that uh, from organizations all across the country, um, civil rights groups, um, various Palestinian advocacy groups, um, all supporting us. And I think having that support was really key to maintaining resolve and motivation. And so I think remembering that, you know, you're not alone. And when it, you're, the backlash is at its most intense, you're probably at your most powerful. And remembering that there's a whole community of people who are really down to support you. And maybe even just mapping out like who those people are, who those resources are, and trying to build solidarity or, or tap into the solidarity that already exists beyond the campus community, I think is another way to take conversations around BDS um, beyond campus walls too. On that note, I wanna thank you, uh, Melek, Liz, Taylor, for joining me on the program of the Transnational Times podcast, and more importantly, for all the labor that you continue to do, for the inspiration that you provide, and the models that you are creating for us. I hope to um, see you soon, hopefully to discuss an expansion of your victories. Great discussion. <laughs> Thank you. Thank all you. Right. Thank you so much.